Let's start to expirate Genetic immunity from the weapons in your hands Weapons for new ritual sacrifice To cleanse our It's a garden. One's hands must get dirty. Absolutely. One must One dig it. One must dig it. Dustin, Doc, thank you for the hosts on the way in. We get ready to go here with Course Correction episode. My asshole oh, leaks. This. I'm constantly plugging leaks in my asshole. That from Rowan Teen, huh? Um, so we are going with episode three of Course Correction. Uh, these pandas are here What's to up, party. Doc? got a uh, an interesting presentation tonight for those of you that are watching the vod also thank you very much if you can't be here i just always appreciate the fact that you're even interested enough to watch but coming up um i was like 30 seconds late because i realized as i was getting ready to go live that i had not updated that screen i was like oh we're still on rocket lab from last night i need to update that so thankfully i do a table of contents in advance for my slide deck i was like here we go that's what's on the agenda this evening so we are going to talk about spacex at the top but that's um that's some dedication here's what's going on tonight episode three we're gonna go talk about spacex starship hopper test this week raptor what raptor is i got a correction or a clarification to make from last week's presentation on sls and the budget we're gonna talk about the saber engine real quick skylon and what that all is we have some information that came to light this week on mars 2020 we have to talk about, and I went, we had a little, I had a little bit of a side tangent last night during a launch countdown for a launch that never happened about how exactly particles coming off of an asteroid could affect things. I actually went and researched that last night and have an answer. We have one other piece of information there that's not going to make women's rights advocates very happy this week. Uh, we'll take a break. And then we have a solid 40 minutes of astrophysics that may melt your brain a little bit. Hopefully it does. So, with that said, why is my clock not counting up here? That should not... Oh, I know why. Let's bring this up. And there's supposed to be a thing there that... Well, I can't fix it now, so we're going to do this. We're just going to make me and the clock disappear. Because I didn't change the text file it's using. So, we'll just talk from here tonight. How about that, guys? Yay. Alrighty, so first up... Starship. Starship, BFR, super heavy. A lot of words get thrown around uh, to get interchangeably. So when you hear news about Starship, Starship is the name of the second stage of SpaceX's BFR, which is now called Super Heavy. Uh, BFR has a, has a couple different meanings. Most of the people that follow space flight have equated it to a Doom reference. Big F rocket but don't get the term super heavy and starship confused because again super heavy is the s1 starship is the s2 so all of the infrastructure that surrounds starship super heavy comprises this core this main makeup 
that SpaceX is moving towards that makes up this Interplanetary Transport System, or ITS, which, this is the really awesome part, they intend for ITS to be completely, 100% reusable, which means the Super Heavy first stage, I mean, they're going to very likely capture, recapture that, that core the same way that they recapture the current Falcon 9 cores, because even, even Falcon Heavy is three Falcon 9 cores. And then the actual Starship stage is going it's going to be fully recoverable but they're going to go they're going about it in an in, I don't know how I'd phrase it in a very interesting way. Uh, I have some video from uh, Elon Musk from this week we'll show you here shortly that shows you how they're going to go about doing it without a heat shield which will be pretty interesting. So as I said, uh, all of the BFR ITS structuring is designed to take pl- the place of everything they they've done already. So there's there's a day in the future where there will be no Falcon 9s. There will be no Falcon Heavies. And everything will be part of this completely 100% reusable infrastructure they've built around Super Heavy and Starship and this ITS system. They, they want to go long duration. Um, the stated goal of SpaceX is to get to Mars, but they have also changed some of their short-term goals so that they are kind of pivoting to the moon first and then Mars. And I think that's more because they see that they can make money they need by going to the moon and supporting NASA's operations. And and SpaceX, I mean, they're their own company and they want to do what they do. But they also sort of have to follow at least the drum step that NASA sets. And NASA wants to go to, to the moon first with Lunar Gateway, boots on the moon by 2028. So, I mean, we'll see. But this is the direction they're going. So Hopper, you may hear the term Hopper in the news, especially this week, especially today. Uh, It's the test version of Starship. Starship is this top piece, and Hopper is actually effectively a a Starship prototype that has the new Raptor engine, has one of them on it right now. And what it's doing is it's effectively, hey Mario, it's effectively just hopping along the ground, making sure the integration between the engine and the Starship Hopper, this top piece, works. They actually did testing today. Uh, there was supposed to test last week, which is why this started to go into this, the uh, presentation for tonight. Uh, we don't have a lot of results. I know they've done leak testing. Uh, the next phase of the test for Hopper will be not one, but three Merlins. Not Merlins, Raptors, I'm sorry. I'm just so used to saying Merlin 10 from so many years reading SpaceX. But it'll be three three Raptor engines and it'll be a suborbital flight. It's they're supposed to go up several hundred feet and make sure that the whole thing goes up, comes down. So the Raptor engine is the new engine. It's a cryogenic methalox, which is methane and liquid oxygen. It's designed to be used for both stages of BFR and development of Raptor. Of wow, yep, I, I keep throwing the words together. It's, that should say I, I was like, oh, is that Discovery right? Discovery Houston, uh, we're still yep. looking at it. Development on Raptor began in 2020, uh, 2012. I can't talk tonight. Engine testing began in 2016, but the really cool thing was engine testing that was done more recently. This is the Raptor engine test. It gives twice hits the air. <laughs> it's twice the power of the Merlin 10. So this is the Raptor engine test from last month. I I didn't talk a lot about it just because it didn't have anything to go with it. Like Raptor's awesome and it's it's going to be an awesome engine. It's going to make SpaceX's ability to launch their vehicles. We talked about 157 ton lift capacity for Falcon Heavy last week. Now, if they if they did, and I've talked to somebody about this, they're not going to refit Falcon Heavy with Raptors. It would take too much reintegration testing. But if they did, in theory, just by basic math, you could get upwards of 300 tons up on a Falcon Heavy. Now, imagine that they don't take it on a Falcon Heavy, but even larger launch vehicle on BFR or an ITS then you could lift a whole lot of weight because there's going to be more than nine Raptors. But anyway, here is the Raptor engine test. Once it decides to load. So that's what she looks like. 
And this is them getting ready to test fire it down in Texas. Do you see those really pretty diamonds that came out right when she fired it first? And that was not even its full throttle. Those little tiny white diamonds that look like little Star Trek symbols pointing back towards the engine. That's, that's the sexy part of a rocket launch. Right there, that, oh my goodness. That is Raptor firing. That was a test, uh, a pad fire, and now they are getting. They have fired it attached to the hopper. That is what the tinfoil prototype of the hopper looks like and Starship. They are not making it out of carbon fiber anymore. They're making it out of stainless steel. And that is what it will look like for its suborbital test with the three engines attached to it. And let me go make this big again. So let's take a look at what we're talking about with, with SpaceX's line of rockets right now. So over here is Falcon 1, and this little tiny guy right there. This is Falcon 9. That's Falcon Heavy. And this is the ITS system with Starship on top. Now this graph is a little old. Payload mass in tons. Sorry, it's not 157, it's 57 tons. So the Falcon Heavy has actually gotten the uh, the Merlin 10 update now. So this 30 tons is actually a little bit higher. It's a little bit, it's a little bit short of 60. So given that they're different engines, you're still talking 150 ton full reuse capability with with Starship, it's going to be an impressive machine once they get it moving. And SpaceX is, they're really in their groove right now. They, they kind of fell out of it with a couple couple goose in 2017, but they're really cruising right now. And even though Starship has gone through a couple iterations where they've kind of completely thrown out the design and, and started over, it looks like they're locked in on what they're doing right now with the stainless steel Starship, so much so that all of these special tools and materials they were using in California to work with uh, with uh, carbon, wow, I can't think of words tonight, composites, carbon composites, they threw it all away. It's, it's like a million dollars of just wrecked material that they're getting ready to toss because all of it was going to the older version of Starship, and now they are pivoting, they have pivoted to this new stainless steel uh, approach. So, reuse of bfr and starship spacex is going to recover the entire thing like i said earlier they're going to recover starship's first stage in a very similar way to how the falcon 9 first stage is recovered now it's i mean bear in mind it's going to be bigger so i'm not sure of course i still love you is going to be the way that they, they may have to build a completely probably will have to build a completely new drone ship to capture the first stage of the uh, the its system but they also intend for the second stage to be reusable. And not only that, they don't want reusability. They want to be able to land it. Yeah, because it's so massive, they're not, I mean, the Falcon 9 diameter is this big, and then the Starship diameter gets bigger. So, of course, I Still Love You is only so wide across. It, I believe they'll have to build a, a distinct drone ship for, uh, for BFR, for ITS, so that it doesn't, tip over off the side simply due to its mass and its height. We'll see what they come up with. But the second stage, they want not only reuse, but immediate reuse. They want to effectively land it, gas it back up, and, and put it on top of another stage one and fire it off again. And the way that Elon Musk has talked about it, he wants that in terms of hours, not days, weeks, or months, which would be really cool. So they don't intend to use a heat shield, which the heat shield is that ablative, that ablative that goes on the bottom, hey, Mario, come back again, the bottom of a spacecraft, so that when it comes in on reentry, this absorbs and deflects the heat off. They're not using a heat shield at all with Starship. What they are doing is using something called transpirational cooling, which is effectively how human beings keep cool. You get hot, you have microscopic little tiny holes in your skin called pores, and those pores let a liquid come out that cools the surface skin of your body. That's what they're talking about doing. Having 
a side of the ship that is intended to have the angle of attack come in, and that side effectively exude liquid to cool what these hexagonal tiles that they want to use to have this liquid come out and cover and keep that cool enough for re-entry. And that's how they're going to get this instant reusability because they're not going to have this ablator that they have to tear off and replace. There's no tiles like the space shuttle. They're effectively going to have to cool the sweat tank, refill it, and be ready to fire it again once they refill the the uh, the, the tanks for the the, um, the Metalox engines. So the the tiles would only be installed installed on the windward side, the the facing side of the craft. That so the, this top side, if they came it upside down, would not have any ability to cool itself. They ha would have to be accurate in their entry, and there was no redundancy for this. They'd have to come in on that windward side every time so that that transpirational cooling could cool that surface. So this is from Musk. Quote, Starship needs to be ready to fly again immediately after landing with zero refurb. It does seem a little sketchy, but let's have a look at what he actually said about or what he showed. This is what they're talking about building. That's really loud. But those are the hexagonal tiles, and on those tiles, they would have liquid coming out onto them. This is the transpirational cooling system that they're talking about using. They, they're testing it now. So what you don't see is the liquid coming out. They're effectively testing the tiles themselves to a temperature that would recreate re-entry conditions, and then they're going to make sure they can cool them off. But they're on, they're on what is effectively step one of it. I hate the fact that I do that every time, so I'll figure that out. So the blowtorches that were in that video brought the temperature of those tiles up to 1,650 degrees Kelvin or 2,500 degrees Fahrenheit, and that is pretty much the most extreme temperature that a vehicle on reentry is going to experience. We'll see. I think it's a nifty idea. If they can pull it off, I really want to know what liquid they're going to use uh, that's basically not immediately going to evaporate on surface contact or on exposure to that heated environment. Uh, obviously, water is not going to get that job done. So what liquid goes that hot and does not immediately turn to vapor? It has to be able to cascade the surface of the tile a enough to at least reduce the heating on the tile. Um, they, again, it's SpaceX, it's proprietary, so we don't know, but in theory, it's a really cool idea, and it would get them to the immediate reuse goal that they're talking about, but is it physically feasible from both an onboard have to carry this much liquid simply for cooling? It's a lot of mass to lift just to cool your system. Is that mass trade-off at, is that mass trade-off for the amount of fuel you need to, to lift it at launch going to be worth it when you could use a, a tiled heat shield or a traditional heat shield method of coming back down? We'll see. But that's where they're aiming. You put the boom Mad. Boom into my heart. What's up? So SpaceX is seeking regulatory approval to launch and build the Super Heavy, the Starship, in both Texas and Florida. They're building it in Texas now. Uh, Musk also, also confirmed that they would build simultaneously in both locations. No more building in California because they're locking in on the idea that, hey, we're launching in Florida. So it would cut down on transport of these big vehicles from California. So they're gonna build them both, they're looking for approval to build both basically right outside the gate at Kennedy and build in Texas. So I wanted to correct something from last week as we move on from SpaceX. Last week in episode two, I presented information that was on crew transfer from the perspective that EM-1, this SLS Orion mission, would be crewed. It's not. EM-2 is the crewed Orion plus ESM plus wet stage launch for lunar injection. The reason I phrased it the way I did on crew capability for EM-1, well, I didn't actually say it was crewed or not crewed, was to illustrate a point I ended up not making. If EM-1 does not launch on SLS, and then EM-2, which would be crewed, does or is still intended to do so per Bridenstine, there would be no prior crew certification of Orion with the ESM and the wet stage on, on SLS, and that would be extremely dangerous. That would be like launching Crew Dragon 2 last month 
for this this later to earlier this month with no prior certification that it's safe for people. Jeff Faust does a tweet um, that I saw that I I, lo- I loved is Bridenstine quotes is quoted as during this conversation on SLS saying if they do go with an alternative plan for EM1 of commercial rockets, they would still put crew on EM2 which would be the first SLS mission. I find that to be brazenly dangerous. And I, the picture down below is effectively those astronauts. <laughs> I'm in danger because they would be. The idea that we would even approach putting crew on Orion on SLS without prior flying Orion on SLS unmanned is a little crazy to me. And I wanted to clear that up because I didn't present that information in its entirety. I kind of missed on it and I wanted to make sure that I came back and was clear on it. Um, but on that note, hold on a sec. Why would they rush like that, says Dushin in chat? Because there was a congressional hearing where they were putting pressure on Bridenstein. I mean, that's the short of it. They're behind schedule by three years is the other reason. Uh, I don't think they would do it. I think at the end of the day, someone at NASA would go, hey, wait a minute. This is dangerous to our crew, and crew safety always comes first. But I also, as things have evolved since last Monday... NASA has been very much on the public PR saying, oh, we're going to meet our 2020 goal with SLS now. Like, they needed to light a fire at NASA itself to show them that SLS was potentially on the chopping block. And they've been very much out there saying, oh, look at what we're doing with SLS this week. You know, this is what we're, we're doing to meet, to meet that 2020 goal. So I really think at the end of the day, the whole genius discussion, the master stroke of public relations that he did, I think that's what it was. I still think we'll see Orion fly EM-1 on SLS. Whether it slips or not, still the question. I think if it does slip, then it's in serious trouble. But I also know that there's been no real conversation about the engineering and mating we talked about last week. So as we tick away toward June, July 2020, there's not a lot of motion on commercial partners saying, yeah, we're ready to go ahead and mate with Orion. The only craft capable still... The lifting of lifting Orion without the ESM is Delta IV. So it's a whole lot of smoke right now with only two solutions. And I think Bridenstine said that to Congress and immediately after simply to further that fire, I don't think that they would actually do it. The Sabre engine. The Sabre engine is really cool. It stands for Synthetic Air Breathing Rocket Engine. And it's a concept that's currently being developed by Reaction Engines Limited for a hypersonic pre-cooled hybrid air breathing rocket engine. What's that mean? It means hybrid's the key word. So engines that function on your everyday airplane are a big thing. There's a big spinny thing in the middle, and that takes air in and compresses it and pushes out the back, and that's how it goes fast. But that's not how you can fly in space because there's no air, right? So how this rocket engine, because it is a rocket engine, would be a hybrid. It would have air intakes for suborbital flight in atmosphere, but also have a rocket engine so that it could use a hypergolic or a solid fuel. I believe they're going hypergolic. There's a, a LOX, probably methane or hydrazine mix they're going to use to fire it. But this engine would facilitate the craft above me. That is Skylon. That's the, the concept. There, What happened with Sabre this week is ESA said this, quote, The positive conclusion of our preliminary design review marks a major milestone in Sabre development. It confirms the test version of this new class, of, this revolutionary new class of engine is ready for implementation, which means ESA is greenlighting Sabre development to move from the theoretical and stand build phase to let's put it on something and see if it works phase. So this is, wow, I don't know why you did that either. Here we go. This is Skylon.
concept. And then it goes ballistic. I mean, it's a matter of controlling the thrust. It's no more fuel than a rocket we use today. But this right here, this is a single stage takeoff and landing vehicle. This is the cornerstone of reusability. If we're gonna have reusable quick to orbit vehicles, we're gonna have to do it this way. That does look awesome. That's where they want to go with it. So, so much fuel, I mean when they want to land and refuel on Mars. What's to say there's not some sort of Mars gateway along the same lines that we're talking about, a lunar gateway, and they don't dock there and take a smaller craft down, because that's really what they should do. They shouldn't take that much mass down to a Martian or lunar surface. Yeah, it's the same reason we, uh, when we went to the moon, there was actually a, uh, a man named John Hubble. Back when we were getting ready to go to the moon, uh, Werner von Braun presented two potential scenarios for getting a craft onto lunar surface. One was called direct, uh, direct ascent, and the other one was called Earth Orbit Rendezvous. Direct ascent was presented as build one big rocket, go right there, but mass just like we said in this, the mass of that rocket became a question. How will we get that much mass back off the lunar surface? The, that rocket would have, have to, had to have been even larger than Saturn V. The other approach was, oh, we'll go up, put a bunch of small rockets up, reassemble the big spacecraft in Earth orbit, and go to the moon. And then John Hubble stood up and said, what, why don't we just take the, this multi-piece craft to the, to the moon and then take a piece off that weighs nothing, take that down to the moon, because then we don't need a whole lot of fuel to get that to come back up. And that's still an, a gateway mentality. This this docking station is just the command module. The command service module was the docking station for the lunar module. It's a model that makes sense just because we don't want to take all of that mass down to any planetary surface until we have an effective way to get mass back off of a planetary surface without the need to refine a boatload of fuel. But that Skylon, it's still pie-in-the-sky fantasy in terms of a ship, but its engine, which is called Saber, has moved forward from a testing to a let's put it on something and see if it actually does what it's supposed to do phase. Alrighty, Mars 2020 budget buster. NASA confirmed on March 18th that the rover, which is due to launch next year, is $2.4 billion over budget. And the problem comes from problems with two of its instruments that will cache samples or later return to Earth, which we want. And NASA stated they will look to cover the overrun on the budget from efficiencies within the mission and reductions from elsewhere in the overall Mars program, but they did not specify where exactly they intend to take that data or that money from. So the Mars 2020 rover is a rover mission which is planned to launch July 17th next year, will touch down on Mars 18 February 2021. Mars rover Mars 2020 rover is a cool thing. It's it's another rover that's going to the to the Martian surface to do science and that's good, but it does carry with it one really cool thing. I know I've already showed some of you this video who've watched some launches, but this thing's really awesome. This is the helicopter. There's your 2020 rover. And there's your helicopter. Now remember, the helicopter has to spin really, really fast because of the atmosphere of Mars being about 1 100th dense that of Earth. But the idea that this thing will fly forward, do exactly what it's doing right there, survey sites, and then fly back to the rover to effectively get a recharge is pretty sweet. Is it on the way yet? No, it doesn't fly until next year, next July. July 17, 2020 is when the rover will fly with helicopter on board.
And it is tiny because it can't be heavy. It's really cool. The helicopter doesn't have any problems instrumentation-wise. It's the rover itself that we're running into problems with. So let me go make this big again. But yeah, right here. 17 July 2020, touchdown of Jazeera Crater on Mars, 18 February 2021. Behind my head, right there. Right in there somewhere. So, Osiris Rex. We talked about this. BRB. Well, Dustin's going to walk away during this, but we'll talk about it anyway, even though he's the big asteroid guy. Osiris Rex. We talked about it last week. We talked about it again last night as we waited for the Rocket Lab launch that didn't happen. But Osiris Rex is the asteroid orbital probe that is currently orbiting Bennu, closing in for a touchdown for sample collection, I believe, next year. So I showed this photo during the launch. I got a better version of it where you can see that there is this ejected coming off of the asteroid right here. So the asteroid itself is spinning, but also periodically spewing particles into space, which makes it an active asteroid. And I had this theory in my head last night that would that push be enough impulse to change the way the asteroid spins, changes orientation, changes orbit? And the answer to that question is no, uh, because of something else called the yarkovsky okeefe radzievsky paddock effect, or YORP effect. What that means is as the asteroid spins, only one side of it is facing the sun. So as that sun-facing side gets hit with the sun, it absorbs radiation, solar energy, photons. And those photons heat that side. And then when that side rotates to darkness, actually about 2 o'clock position in terms of its own axis... It has to rele it releases that photonic energy, and that photonic energy is way more than the particulate exhaust that's coming off of Bennu, and that actually is what controls the fact that the asteroid does not have a persistent elliptical orbit around the sun, but actually has gotten inside the asteroid belt and is actually over a long period of time spiraling into the sun because the way in which the sun and the photons work when it turns and pushes is actually pushing itself a little closer to the sun a little bit closer to the sun a little bit closer to the sun every time that d light side that is now dark releases that radiation energy so no is the answer to my own question and this yorp effect is why i thought it was interesting to answer that because it was yesterday and i actually the only reason i i have the answer is i was listening to a podcast and they talked exactly about the yorp effect and i was like oh well, that answers my question, and I went and read about it, and it does exactly that. It, it ca causes this light to dark energy transfer. Well, no, it's about tree By active, I mean that it's doing. Oh, back up, back up, back up. It's this. I don't, it might be hard to see, but over here on this side of the photo is actually particles. So it's actually you have to equate it to like it's not volcanic, but it is active like a volcano. It is from its own interior, exuding particles. It's spitting particles out into space. It is also rotating, but that's that's an orbital thing. That's just, it's rotating because it's in a gravitational influence. But it's actually spitting stuff out. Is It's not just loose rocks and dust. That's a guess, I don't know. It's spitting something out into space. I don't know if Osiris Rex will be able to tell you what the material is. Um, I do know that yeah, phlegm. I mean, so they were, the asteroid's going mm, mm, like your dad in the shower. Or like my dad in the shower, anyway. <laughs> You're welcome, dad, when you watch this video later. <laughs> so, I would imagine that <laughs> the material is. It's almost. Im I would say it's nearly impossible for this thing to have any sort of liquid core with a mantle and pressure plates, which is what causes a volcano. I would bet money that the particles that are coming off of it in this manner are an effect of its spin. But we don't know. And we won't know until 
Osiris Rex lands and we get a better idea of it, but the idea that it is shedding material in a specific vector does make it active versus asteroids that don't do that. Hopefully, <laughs> asteroid with a smoker's cop, says Dustin. Hopefully that, that answers the question as well as I can. Uh, it's simply, I can't answer it any better because we don't have the necessary information to answer it any better. Uh, I know what NASA tells me on us on Bennu. I, I mean, I'm interested, and it's become a much more interesting mission, let's put it that way. But as we learn more, and as we approach an Osiris Rex landing date, uh, we'll definitely we'll continue to check back in with it. So, history will have to wait. We had talked about the very first all-female spacewalk. It was supposed to be Spacewalk 53, and it was supposed to be this Friday. Well, Spacewalk 53 is still happening. It is still happening Friday. But McLean and Christina Cook were both scheduled to go out on the spacewalk, but after consulting with McLean and Nick Haig following Spacewalk 52, which they did last Friday, where they started replacing batteries, old batteries out for better versions on the, on the ISS, um, the station managers decided to adjust the assignments due in part, NASA says due in part, to spacesuit availability on the station. McLean learned during the spacewalk that a medium-sized upper torso, which is essentially the shirt of the spacesuit, fit her best. But there's only one medium-sized torso on the ISS, and that would mean there is not, there would not be one for Christina Cook. So Cook and Haig will now make the spacewalk this Friday, but it will no longer be humanity's first all-woman spacewalk. Um, Twitter's been interesting on this topic today. This, this news broke about two hours before the stream tonight, and I wanted to make sure it was included. But there's a whole lot of, oh, why, NASA? It's like, well, the big reason is because Anne McLean's grown two inches since she's been what, since she's been in space. Her size has changed. NASA didn't make a ground mistake and go, oh, the, the measurements we took on, on Anne McLean, uh, we screwed up. No, she's a different size now. She's, she's bigger than she was in terms of her torso, which means the small, which probably was what she was wearing, is too tight on her. It, or it does not go down far enough, there's some level of discomfort that the, the mission managers don't like, and that's why this is happening. It's not that NASA has a vendetta against any specific gender. But anyway, that's a change. It sucks from a we wanted to make history perspective, but it is the probably the correct choice to make simply because you don't want an astronaut wearing a spacesuit that doesn't fit them correctly. At the end of the day, Haig is the person that's going to go out with Christina Cook. And I'm saying her name over and over. One to drill into my head, that's how you say it. Uh, but I've also heard other people mispronouncing it in the past week. It is pronounced Cook. Alrighty. So, I have 40 more minutes of material plus discussion to go over. But, it's a lot of material. We're going to do a discussion about a presentation from an astrophysics perspective. And it's really cool. There are two topics... No Steve Urkel pants in space. Exactly, Mads. We're going to talk about astrophysics coming up here. I'm going to take a break before we do it because it is 40 minutes straight. There are two core concepts that I wanted to get into the vernacular before we start. The first one is entropy. Entropy is a word that represents the unavailability of a system's, or in this case, the universe's, our universe's thermal energy for conversion to mechanical work. So, thermal energy conversion to mechanical work. Photosynthesis uses that thermal energy from the sun. Other stars use each other's thermal energy for the creation of other things. Nebula use the available thermal energy of matter in the universe to create stars. Entropy is when that thermal energy becomes unavailable. The best way to think about it is, as the universe gets colder, there is less energy to do stuff with. Entropy is that. It is introducing this disorder within a system or a universe where heat is no longer available for conversion to, to work or material. And then the other word I wanted to bring into the vernacular is photon. I said it earlier when I was saying photons hit the asteroid, but a photon is a quantum particle. It's light. It's, it is actually the, the, the quantum particle of light or other radiation. A photon carries energy proportional to the radiation frequency, meaning its energy level is as high as the radiation's wavelength is. 
but it has no mass at rest. It actually has no mass at all. It's completely a particle comprised of energy, which is every light you see is radiation in some form. The sun putting light on us is radiation. It is in the form of photons. And the reason you get warm in direct sunlight is because the photonic energy wavelength is really high. And that photon energy hits your skin, transfers the energy to your mass, to your matter, and raises its temperature. So I, there's a difference between photons and electrons in the brain. People sometimes get the concepts confused. Electrons are actually a physical material thing, whereas photons are completely energy. So get a drink, go to the bathroom, and get ready, because this is going to blow your minds a little bit. I'll be back in a minute or two. I'm going to fill my drink up, go to the bathroom. We'll sit down. We're going to get a journey that starts with the Big Bang and ends with the end of our universe. I'll be right back. Discovery, nominal Nico, home one, not required. So I'll admit, I kind of approach in-game combat as like a friggin' muscle-brown brute, and I was like, I hit to death. You will endure this loss <laughs> and learn from it. That sounded like a super mutant. I hope it was a hell of a teaser line. It's, it's going to be really cool. So let me do one thing here real quick. I want to make sure that, that uh, Flux is turned off because I don't want the lighting on this to be ruined by anything. So where is Flux? Let's disable you. Uh, disable until sunrise. Turn you back on if I want you. That's the light visibility on the presentation. A little bit more blue light, but it will be much more visible to you. So I see Mads is back. I don't want to start this until everyone's kind of ready to go. So we will, let me make sure I turn that off. I thought it did, but let's go back over to this. May never be ready. So welcome in for a journey. Let's start with this. This, these two videos I'm gonna to present tonight are both produced by a Patreon creator named Melody Sheep. Um, they, I'm not sure of their gender, I believe it's a man, but they produce some really, really cool videos. Um, some of the money that comes in from Patreon, the Patreons here goes to pay for a Patreon subscription to Melody Sheep so that I feel like I get to use their videos. It's, it's really informative for us to do some of this stuff. And the presentation quality here is super high. So, welcome to time lapse of the entire universe. The Big Bang until right now. You guys ready? Because here we go.
13 billion years of time unfolding on a 10 minute scale from the Big Bang to right now. Every passing second currently represents 22 million years. And on this scale, humans do not appear until the last fraction of a second. The universe begins in three, two, one, go. You're already at 50 million years, the Big Bang, 13.7 billion years ago. Crossing 250 million years. From the primordial years. cloud of gas and cosmic dust, gravity forged the stars. Hundred million years. What a big muscle. Yes, you do. That is Professor Brian. Gravity Kropsky. connects star systems together in vast galaxies and steers them on their journey through unbounded space. The relentless flow of time has driven the evolution of the universe and created extraordinary wonders. Early galaxies are now forming 1,500 million years after the Big Bang. Some galaxies form so close together that they're locked in a gravitational embrace. Magnificent sight it would be. Twenty five hundred million years into the Big Bang, and all the galaxies are still forming. Eleven billion years ago and counting down As to it humanity. Evolves, the universe passes through distinct eras. Vast ages whose beginnings and endings are marked by unique milestones. The births and deaths of its wonders. Thirty five hundred million years since We're the Big the Bang. Of a grand evolutionary sequence, cosmic evolution, about which we are only occasionally aware. Hey Fish, welcome in. Gravity is the great creator, the constructor of the 4,000 million years Milky Way forms after the Big Bang. But gravity is also the destroyer because it's relentless. When a star around 15 times the mass of our sun collapses, all the matter in its core is crushed into an infinite void of blackness known as a stellar mass black hole. The immense gravitational pull of these monsters can rip a star apart. They tear matter from its surface and drag it into orbit. This superheated matter spins around the mouth of the black hole and great jets of radiation fire from the core. Although these jets can be seen across the cosmos, the core itself remains a mystery. Not even light can escape, so their interior is forever hidden from us. Then Throughout a star's life, there is a constant battle between energy pushing out and gravity pushing in. 
when it runs out of fuel, the star collapses and then explodes with the brightness of a billion suns. Seven point one billion years ago, the first stars begin to die. And those that don't go and become black holes expel the spell mass into apart, the universe to make new stars. Fire out into space all the elements that it created in its life and death. These are new stars forming from the elements blown out by supernova explosions. New stars being born from the remains of dead ones. And it's from this universal process of death and rebirth that we emerged. Because it was in a nebula just like this, five billion years ago, that our sun was formed. Five clouds of hydrogen collapse million further years ago and further under the force of gravity. Our and sun is born. The life cycle of a new 8. star 4 has billion begun. years after the Big Bang. A star was born that would come to be known as the Sun. Around it, a network of planets formed. Among them was the Earth. Debris left over from the formation of the solar system collides with the Earth. continents were still forming. The land was the dominated Aegean by Eon, volcanoes. 4,000 million Hostile years ago. Lifeless. 10 billion years after the Big Bang. But deep in the oceans, life had begun. The latest theory is that chemicals spewing from underwater volcanic vents solidified and created the conditions needed for the first cells to form. For some three billion years, Simple microscopic organisms were the most advanced form of life on the planet. Cyanobacteria and other oxygen producing microbes began to bloom. These flourished in colonies of plant like microbes that pumped out enormous volumes of oxygen. And that is the key oxygen. And it was this increase in oxygen that was the key to the rise of the animal kingdom. Organisms started using oxygen to respire, yielding a lot more energy, which allowed the development of more complex life. Just before complex life appeared, the world was in the grip of the biggest ice age in its entire history. Only 900 or so million years ago. <laughs> and then suddenly, advanced organisms appeared. That's 100 
150 million years ago for dinosaurs to live using track. And that last half second was us. This is no place for the weak or the foolhardy. That's us to this point. From the Big Bang to humanity's existence and flourishing on Earth. Well, Fish, um, I would encourage you to watch the VOD because that is the first 10 minutes of 40 minutes. That is how we got here. The next 30 minutes is where are we exactly going? Anybody need a break or have questions before we move on? Big Bang to now. More than happy to answer what I know. Oh, cool. Well, then uh, the VOD will be available on YouTube if you want to catch the next part uh, after your kiddo is uh, in bed or if you want to come in at a later stage. We have 30 minutes of content left to go. But everybody else in chat, I think that's a pretty amazing representation of time. Every second counts for a specific amount of time. The next presentation that's going to be shown also does the same thing except it effectively takes us from sorry my nose is itchy from now until there is no universe or no universe in any form that we know it and beyond and the reason that i wanted to bring the second part up is it's important for humanity to continue to educate itself and discover because at some point we can't live on earth anymore but we also can't live in this universe anymore. It's a long, 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 long time from now. But understanding some aspects of this is going to melt your brains a little bit. It did the first time when I started reading about it a long time ago. But this is the most elegant way that I've ever seen it presented. That is not where I wanted to be. That's where I want to be. Time lapse of the future. I actually was on the slide I wanted. So, here we go. What does our future hold? How will this universe meet its end? This is a might unfold after a point. Doubling our speed through time every five seconds. The Holocene has ended. What we do now and in the next few years will profoundly affect the next few thousand years. The only conditions modern humans have ever known so far are changing, and changing fast. Nothing stays the same on this planet. Everything changes. The Earth is, is going into one of these jumps, and you don't know what is going to be on the other side of those jumps. The Earth is always jumping. this planet. Things are not still. Everything is turning. Here's now 10,000. And cars go supernova. The Sahara becomes a tropical section of the planet. And the constellations of our sky begin to wander. Voyager passes its first nearby star at 50,000 years. On our super volcanoes to erupt. 200,000 years. One, that one million years, the polar footprints are gone. Still monuments on Earth begin to erode at 30, 2.5 million years. Around 10 million years, the deadly gamma ray burst comes from the sun. 15 million years, Phobos and Deimos are rings around Mars. 
30 million years, Saturn's rings are gone. 50 million years, all of Antarctica is no longer ice. And by 100 million years, a major asteroid has hit the Earth. Which will help form a new supercontinent as shelves move. As it begins to run out of fuel, the sun won't simply fade away to nothing. One billion years off planet life is gone. Its core will collapse, and the extra heat this generates will cause its outer layers to expand. Seven billion years, the Earth is destroyed by the sun is now dead. Sun. Its remains slowly cooling in the freezing temperatures of deep space. I hope we're off it by then. Bear in mind, this is 30 minutes of a presentation. You are at the five the minute mark. The fate of the sun is the same as for all stars. One day, they must all eventually die and the cosmos will be plunged into eternal night. All stars eventually will run out of fuel. The temperature of the universe drops. The stars, one by one, in the night sky will turn off. And there'll be no more new stars created. And so that the universe will end not with a bang, but with a whimper. 25, 30 trillion years. The last red dwarf and star to die. But in ice. With no fuel left to burn, a white dwarf's faint glow comes from the last residual heat from its extinguished furnace. Looking at it from where the Earth is now, it would only generate the same amount of light as the full moon on a clear night. The faint glow of white dwarves will provide the only illumination in a dark and empty void littered with dead stars and black holes. In some ways it's kind of a ghost universe. It's the corpses, the zombie stars, that will take us into the future. Gravity ejects dead stars and planets from the galaxies, sending them out into the void. By chance, some brown dwarfs collide and accidentally form new stars. Colliding neutron stars puncture the darkness with supernovae. Nine billion trillion years from now. Any surviving life forms left in the universe need to find refuge around these dying white dwarf stars 300 billion trillion years from now. But with enough time, even those dwarf stars will die. A black dwarf will be the final fate of those last stars. White dwarfs that have become so cold they barely emit any more heat or light. Black dwarves are dark, dense, decaying balls of degenerate matter. Little more than the ashes of stars.
Their constituent atoms are so severely crushed that black dwarves are a million times denser than our sun. Stars take so long to reach this point, we believe there are currently no black dwarves in the universe. Any matter that fails to escape its galaxy is consumed into a supermassive black hole at the center of that galaxy. Forty-five trillion, thousand trillion trillion years. Black holes begin to swallow all of the remaining stray matter in the universe as they get bigger. The rotational energy of those black holes is the last reliable source of energy in the universe. At seven million trillion years. We have trillion, a pace trillion of life years. that's based on really the energy available to us now. You could imagine living conscious systems which have a very different pace and therefore can extend out at least a lot farther than you'd imagine otherwise. You could have a living system where if it had a thought every 10 trillion years, that would seem normal. Yes. Even if our life dies out, one could imagine at some time arbitrarily far in the future, a fluctuation occurs which allows intelligent life to exist again for a little while. So you might have islands in time of intelligence. Ten billion, trillion, trillion years. As the expansion of the universe accelerates, it begins to spread matter apart faster than the speed of light. At this point, distant galaxies and stars are receding so fast, their light becomes undetectable. And the remaining secrets that those light holds will no longer be unlockable from the scientific perspective that we currently understand. Current theories predict that atoms themselves will begin to decay, and the decay of matter at the atomic level will destroy proton, any remaining matter in the universe. Building blocks of atomic matter, what makes us up, can just spontaneously fall apart. Any material that evades the pull of a black hole eventually dies away as its protons disintegrate. Proton decay is still an unproven theory, so it may look different. But proton decay on a relativity scale as matter accelerates beyond the speed of light. That's what they're basing it on. The matter inside black dwarfs, the last matter in the universe, will eventually evaporate away and be carried off into the void as radiation, leaving absolutely nothing behind. 10,000 trillion 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 years. The last mass and matter in those black dwarves is gone. With the black gone. dwarves gone, there won't be a single atom of matter left. Welcome to the black hole era. All that will remain of our once rich cosmos will be particles of light and black holes. No planets, no stars, no stellar remains of any form, no matter of any kind for life to cling on to. But on a cosmic scale, time is still very much in its early phase.
cold, dark, and empty, our universe will spend most of its lifespan like this. This is a core thing. Our universe gives only a brief moment to shine, a haven in time, safe the from time the fire of its birth and the coldness of its death. In the universe's adolescence, little tiny space life is in its possible. timeline. But it's a window that doesn't stay open for long. As a fraction of the lifespan of the universe, as measured from its beginning to the evaporation of the last black hole, life as we know it is only possible for one thousandth of a billion billion billionth billion billion billionth billion billion billionth of a percent. Holes become the fundamental building block of the universe. A galaxy will basically be a supermassive black hole in a center with smaller black holes orbiting it. Zombie galaxies filled with black holes continue to evolve. They'll lead each other and they'll get bigger and maybe they'll fall into the supermassive black hole and it'll get bigger. The universe will still be an exciting dynamic place. It's just that the time scales we're talking about are now trillions of years instead of trillions, thousands, trillions, millions trillions, millions of years. trillions of years. Black hole mergers become the main event of the universe at 500 trillion, 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 trillion years from now. Some grow to massive sizes, possibly trillions of size, sorry, times the mass of our sun. And when they come together, it's a quantum event that sends a shock wave Black out through the universe. can bang on space-time like mallets on a drum. And they have a very characteristic song. Imagine two black holes that have lived a long life together. At the end of their lives, they're going around each other, crossing thousands of kilometers in a fraction of a second. As they do so, they leave behind in their wake a ringing of space, an actual wave on space time. Be there to see it though. Space squeezes and stretches as it emanates out from these black holes banging on the universe. Those are the gravitational waves, they are literally the sounds of space ringing. And they will travel out from these black holes at the speed of light as they ring down and coalesce to one spinning, quiet black hole. If you were standing near enough, your ear would resonate with the squeezing and stretching of space. You would literally hear the sound. Imagine a lighter black hole falling into a very heavy black hole. The sound you're hearing is a light black hole banging on space each time it gets close. As it falls in, it gets faster and it gets louder. Believe it or not, scientists used to think black holes were immortal, but they're even not. these will one day die. Black holes will die. Now we're talking about time scales of unimaginable length, quadrillions of years into the future. 
on that time scale, even the black holes begin to evaporate. This is called Hawking radiation. Stephen Hawking discovered, postulated this, and it's according to quantum accurate. mechanics. Space is filled with virtual particles, anandi particles, that are constantly materializing in pairs, separating, coming together again, and annihilating each other. In the presence of a black hole, one member of a pair of virtual particles may fall into the hole leaving the other member without a partner with which to annihilate and therefore reducing the, the mass of the black particle hole appears to be radiation emitted by the black hole so as the black hole radiates so, photonic energy black it loses holes mass are not eternal and over a very long period of time they evaporate away at an increasing rate until they vanish in a gigantic explosion there you go because they radiate virtual particles that are now unpaired Quantum mechanics has allowed they die. particles and radiation to escape from the ultimate prison a black hole Black holes begin to evaporate, erasing the last large-scale structures in the universe at about 25 million trillion 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 years. It becomes a firework show every time one goes up in a night sky that no one can look in. Interesting statement, Jay Mitch. What if you could? The black hole holes slowly die off. The universe continues to expand, driven by dark energy. Philosophers and poets have asked the question, will the world end in fire or ice? We can now give an answer. The latest evidence shows that the universe is not slowing down, but it's speeding up out of control. And the universe, we think, will die in ice. Trillions upon trillions of years from now. Empty space itself has energy. In every little cubic centimeter of space, whether or not there's stuff, whether or not there's particles, matter, radiation, or whatever, there is still energy, even in the space itself. Yes. And this energy, according to Einstein, exerts a push on the universe. What is the weird stuff that's accelerating the universe? We call it dark energy. And this stuff is the dominant stuff of the universe. Almost three quarters of the matter energy content of the universe is this dark energy. And we don't know what it is. Not at all. Dark energy, unlike matter or radiation, does not dilute away as the universe expands. This has crucial... Want to stop on that point. What he just said is, unlike matter or energy, dark energy does not dilute as the universe expands. What he just suggested is theory, and it suggests that dark energy has no relationship with entropy, with that availability of energy in the universe that be, can, can be converted to mechanical use. It is explicitly a theory. It's an important, it's an important distinction to make. Implications for what the universe is going to do in the future. So what will be the future of the universe? Well, if the dark energy remains dominant and repulsive, the universe will expand forever. At an ever increasing rate, Velocity of expansion will continue faster and faster and faster with time. 
a runaway universe. 70% of the energy of the universe resides in empty space, and we don't understand why. But we do know what will happen if that energy continues to be there, the universe will become cold and dark and empty. That's the future as it might be. We don't know because we don't yet understand we the nature of dark energy. We also don't know what happens Until when the do, rate of acceleration the of the universe We won't even understand the, our own origins. And that's why we want to know and study this subject. There it is. If somehow dark energy weakens over time, the university can actually collapse back in on itself. Or if it goes too fast, it can tear space time apart, ripping the actual essential fabric of the universe into shreds. Welcome to the multiverse. Other universes could have the right conditions for life and others could be ripped apart by their own definition of physics but it's important that they exist if they exist because if they don't we don't have anywhere to go the forecast does seem to be for an ever colder, ever empty universe. But then, of course, we have to ask, could that end lead to a new beginning? And there are ideas whereby uh, what actually is the end of our universe could, in some sense, be linked to the beginning of a new one. Could the end of our universe link to the beginning of a different one? There may be a way to escape our universe before entropy erases everything. If we could create our own virtual universes, or with enough energy, create another one just like our own, and then step from our universe into our We've worked out the mathematics, our creation. the equations. They seem to say that if you have an atom smasher that can concentrate tremendous amounts of energy at a single point, you can perhaps open up a gateway a baby universe. Facing the death of everything there is, this perhaps is their only possibility of escape. And this also raises a very intriguing possibility, sheer speculation of course, that perhaps any universe that has intelligent life in it We'll create baby universes, we'll create lifeboats, and proliferate child universes. One way. So an evolution may take among universes in the multiverse. Survival of the fittest may take place. So those universes which do not have intelligent life are infertile. They have no children. But those universes that have mild temperatures, stars like us, would create civilizations that could open up child universes, and, physics and they would then sense. proliferate. We would have to create a child universe with Newtonian physics. If there's no way to escape the universe, entropy will march on, destroying the last of the supermassive black holes. And as the last one dies, there will be one last firework in the sky.
after an unimaginable length of time. Even the black holes will have evaporated and the universe will be nothing but a sea of photons gradually tending towards the same temperature as the expansion of the universe cools them towards absolute zero. That radiation that escaped the black holes is all that's left and it's cooling. That light, the last light. Once the very last remnants of the very last stars have finally decayed away to nothing and everything reaches the same temperature, the story of the universe finally comes to an end. For the first time in its life, the universe will be permanent and unchanging. Entropy finally stops increasing because the cosmos cannot get any more disordered. Nothing happens, and it keeps not happening forever. Everything has its wonders, even darkness and silence, and I learn whatever state I may be in, therein to be content. So I have an alternate idea besides the lifeboat universe. That is not presented here, it's not my idea. But it is one that bears a conversation in parallel to what you just watched. One, hopefully you found that to be educational, interesting, thought-provoking. But what was not discussed was what instead, instead of if we come up with a mechanical way or an energy-based way to create a lifeboat universe or an ability to step into a discoverable alternate universe that's governed by our same physics, we understand how to manipulate gravity, which in turn would give us the ability to manipulate time. And instead of stepping out of this universe, we continually step back in time within our own universe to a different physical place so that our societies can continue to grow, effectively cheating what is currently, in Newtonian physics, a time constant, but in quantum mechanics, not a constant. And I think that's the more realistic answer. But anyway, this is why I love space, and why I'm, I'm so enthusiastic about it. Eventually the Earth, in the first five minutes of that video, goes bye-bye. We have to be somewhere else by then. There's, there's no saving the planet from anything at that point. The Earth, will, the Earth will be consumed by the sun. You saw that massive volcanoes will erupt. Could you dumb it down for those in the back, says J. Mitch. So, you have the concept of time as a linear object. It just goes from point A to point B. But manipulating gravity would allow that line to become foldable. Gravity as manipulating force and not a constant, you could actually physically change your position on the timeline by the manipulation of gravity and place yourself back in an earlier position in a different place with the current knowledge set of humanity or current level of technology and start continuing to build before humanity even existed and continue looping yourself back as a society beating the clock that is entropy that is why they said black holes mess with space time yes because they have that effect at a gravitational level. And I think that is the more achievable goal. But did I effectively dumb it down for J. Mitch in the back? Did I, it's, let's put it this way. If you've ever watched Interstellar and don't get the ending, that's the ending. <laughs> that's, how, that's how Matthew McConaughey's character is able to go back to the bookshelf and push the books out to send himself a message. It's the same idea. 
the people who are helping humanity in that movie have enabled humanity to leverage gravity as of an additional dimensional force and by doing so have allowed humanity to move up and down the time scale and not be constrained to a singular direction and measurement of time that's the ending of that movie and that is the most feasible in my opinion approach to a cyclical existence within the same universe and the preservation of our own species but even on that even if we achieve that even with all the habitable bodies that are out there in the universe eventually we will not have enough of them and you're talking about taking that one trillion 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 time scale before matter goes bye-bye and maybe taking that out to an exponential rate which would give an unimaginable amount of time and a lease on life to intelligent life in whatever form it takes but still at the end of the day you will reach a period in that time where even that can't save everything because you will have run out of material space. The one thing that was mentioned that I paused it for was dark energy and the theory that it does not have an entropic relationship. And if that's true, then as the universe continues to accelerate, it will crest the speed of light. And at that point, no one has any mathematical definition for what will happen to the fabric of space-time. Will it shred? Will the definition of what is mass and matter and energy fundamentally alter? Don't know. But this is the stuff that I am up at 1 o'clock in the morning thinking about. In any event, thank you very much for, for watching those two presentations. I felt they were some of the best ways to provide an, an entry point and understanding to both the origin of the universe and some of the theories on where it's going. So we're wrapping up, but a couple things. One, don't forget these videos, everything else is presented on the YouTube channel, which you can hit a button down below uh, on the Mixer page. You can also get to YouTube from coursecorrection.space, which is where I post all of these videos. Um, and I'm not begging here anything, but I will mention uh, simply that videos presented by Melody Sheep, and other content that I get, I do license from them so that we go down a path where we're not standing on someone else's work but still presenting educational material. All of the Patreon donations effectively go and help me become patrons somewhere else to help those content creators create things that help us. So if you feel inclined, uh, that's where that money goes. So, upcoming launches. I decided that we are not going to track this Rocket Lab launch because I went back and looked at its history. It's been rescheduled for tomorrow, but I'm not planning on live streaming it because I have no confidence that we'll launch tomorrow. The reason it was canceled last night was because of a video transmitter, and I actually like this. They decided they could have still launched the rocket, but they could not have shown us the launch of the rocket, and that's why they postponed. So with me saying I'm not going to show it tomorrow, of course it will launch tomorrow, but it has slipped so many times, I don't want to yank people's chain anymore and say, hey, show up, and then not have it happen. So we will cover that DARPA launch of R3-D2 next Monday. Coming up this Sunday night, there is a GTO-1 space flight launch on Falcon 9 from Kennedy at 8 p.m. Eastern Time. I plan on presenting that one live, and that stream will probably start around 7-ish, but I'll try to queue it up in line with when NASA and SpaceX begin their coverage. And then we are getting very, very close to that date for Falcon Heavy being locked in, which would be the following Sunday on April 7th at 6 p.m. We don't have a specific launch time yet. It's within a 6 to 9 p.m. window, I believe, right now. There is range clearance for that time frame. It will be streamed if the schedule holds. Uh, that's going to be a sight to see. That's going to be a really amazing launch. It'll be one of the biggest rocket launches that goes up this year, and it will definitely be the biggest delivery vehicle we have ever watched together again at the bottom if you like melody sheep there's her link that's her patreon is her patreon page i'm not sure again gender um there are other videos as well that have been made that are musical presenting information both from a biological and astrophysical presentation perspective they're interesting i enjoyed them and if you enjoyed what you watched tonight i encourage you to go out and find their youtube channel watch some more Next week, I don't know how else to ask this. What's wrong with just letting things end instead of cheating time?
says Matt. I think it's against the survival nature of intelligent species. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I think it presents a philosophical question to humanity that says, what are we doing this all for then? What is the purpose of continuing to strive forward to understand things, to make a better world for people if at the end of the day there is no escape from its obliteration? I think that's the philosophical question. So, for me, there's nothing wrong with letting the universe, quantum mechanics, and relativity do its job. And who knows what the state of intelligence may be at that point. It may not even have to be matter-based. I don't see anything wrong with it. But I know that some aspects of intelligence would reject the idea of an in inevitable demise. And that's why the question gets asked. It's a good question. So, next week. Playing, or as watching Mango, and if you're not following Mango Plays Games, um, she's one of the Outlaws. You can find her on the Outlaws team page on Mixer. She also gets announced by the Big Top Outlaws Twitter account, but she started streaming again as she announced it to us during a stream last week. She's playing Satisfactory. And Satisfactory has a space elevator, and she basically said, Space elevators? How does that work? And we're going to explain how space elevators work in theory, and what they would do for us as a space-faring people. We will cover, finally, Spacewalks 52 and 53 once they're both done. We will recap the Falcon 9 flight. We will talk about something that went explodey over the Bering Sea back in December. We will cover any additional questions that you have. If you ask them, please feel free to ask questions and I will investigate them as hard as I can to come up with as good of and as objective of an answer as I can provide. And I'm very open to questions. I would rather cover topics that you are all curious about and anything else that develops across the next week. So again, ask away, ask your questions. It's a very fun place to hang out. The Big Top Outlaws Discord. That's the link, discord.me slash BTO. Uh, that's the best place to leave a question. Leave it in the BOSA channel. And let's go back over here. So, thank you very much for being here, everybody. I do plan on streaming later in the week, uh, KSP again. I felt everyone was really engaged in it last week, or last week, last night, with the drama <laughs> of uh, Space Lab with, um, with people stranded in it. I have done some off-stream builds just to get some ideas in my head of constructor drones and payload delivery systems to put modules onto this the station without having the wet stages so close and i've also started sketching out diagrams of how to move forward with the overall station build that is wednesday i believe 7 p.m uh but the schedule in the outlaws discord and the early fairing disconnect yes uh, i believe that was funny. That's just a staging thing. I had a stage in the wrong place and blew the fairing on a launch pad. Thank you, Doc. But anyway, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, an hour and 41 minutes is the longest course correction we've ever done. We had, I hope you guys had fun, found the information presented tonight to be thought-provoking, stimulating at a, at a brain level to make you think about the larger picture on a much grander scale. And uh, if you have any questions about what was presented tonight that I haven't covered, please feel free. We'll follow up on those questions next week as well. But other than that, that is the episode for the week. I, I was just going to say, I may talk less when these streams are going. Everyone seems to talk less when these streams are going unless they have a question. And I see who's in the chat. I see, and it's, it's just a matter of if you enjoy this content, and it seems like we have a core group that does, I enjoy, I enjoy producing it because it drives me to learn more. And there's nothing ever wrong with me doing that. Um, so the idea that some people want to share that is awesome. And I'll keep doing it even if it's only for an audience of two. So let's go see who is streaming and pass the torch on to them. Let's see who is out there tonight. Mork. So let's go exit out of here. We hosted Mork a few times in the last week. Let's see who else is out there in Mixer land. I need to unmute this tab. I muted it when I go live. Let's see. 
Daisy playing The Walking Dead. I was bugging Daisy last night. Let's go give Daisy a host. Bring the, uh, the... She's playing a uh, European truck simulator yesterday, which made me go play American truck simulator yesterday. It was a lot of fun. She's playing Walking Dead. It looks like it's Telltale, which uh, she may have your interaction turn on. I don't know. But we'll take you over to Daisy. You guys have a good night. And again, thank you very much for everyone who showed up tonight and took part in this. I do appreciate it. And we'll talk to you Wednesday night in Discords and very likely in Dustin's channel tomorrow morning. Have a good night, everybody.